My name is Patrick Dore, Chief of the Bureau of Automotive Repair, and I want to welcome everyone to the Bureau of Automotive Repair's regulatory workshop on swamp check equipment security and fraud prevention. Presentation that's going to be given by one of our air quality engineers in the research branch here at BAR, Paul Hedgeland. Before I turn it over to Paul for a PowerPoint presentation, I would like to thank all of the BAR advisory group members who uh, were at the meeting this morning who have rejoined us um, for the workshop, uh, as well as any public participants. Uh, I see on here that Bud Rice is still with us as part of the workshop, Bud represents the- uh, This meeting is being recorded. Bud represents the California Automotive Business Coalition. Um, let's see, Dave Kusa also has come back for this afternoon's session, representing the Automotive Service Council of California. Um, let's see, Jack Maladonna representing the California Auto Body Association with other interests. Johan Gallo, also with Cal ABC or the California Automotive Business Coalition. Megan McKernan with uh, Southern Cal Triple A. I don't remember the official title uh, off the top of my head. Rick Escalambre with uh, California Automotive Teachers. Tracy Renee, also with the Automotive Service Council of California, or otherwise known as ASBCA. I think that's it for the advisory group members that have rejoined us afternoon session. And thank you all for doing so. Um, very interested in doing additional work in and enhancements to shore up any loopholes in the smog check program where cars are slipping through, potentially cars that could be going to your shops or your, your members of your association's uh, shops uh, that are otherwise being converted and not, not being inspected appropriately. I uh, want to share with you some things that uh, we're looking at in terms of enhancing the equipment security and preventing the amount of fraud that is going on with the program since we've been uh, undergoing uh, onboard diagnostic or OBD focused inspections uh, for about the last seven years since 2013. So, want to present that in the form of a PowerPoint presentation that Paul will give in just a few short moments, and then we'll open it up for any questions or comments. Uh, Paul, um, you're listening out there, if there's any natural breaks in your presentation where you want to stop and uh, invite questions uh, rather than going through the entire presentation, that's up to you. Otherwise, you just plow right through it, and we'll, we'll open it up for questions at the end. It's, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. All right, anything before I turn it over to, not Paul, but I do need to turn it back to our moderator, Elizabeth Cornell. I want to rec uh, recognize her and the great work she did with the uh, Bar Advisory Group meeting this morning. Uh, we will have her moderate this afternoon's regulatory workshop presentation and discussion. Uh, Elizabeth, welcome, and please, uh, Hope you can go over a few ground rules for everyone again as reminders for those who will be there for the morning session, but any new participants, the ground rules for the workshop and the WebEx presentation. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, I'll go over some ground rules. Um, so before we get started with the workshop, if I can remind advisory group members and staff who are not speaking to please mute your microphone. It, if I hear any background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will provide either a brief reminder or simply mute your microphones as to not interrupt the meeting. There are members of the public in the audience and um, so if I ask if you can please identify your names before speaking, so that goes for staff and advisory group members. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When um, there's a point where public comment is appropriate, I'll open up the Q&A feature. Members of the public can indicate they would like to make a comment by clicking at the icon with the question mark located at the bottom right corner of the WebEx screen and I'll have those up um, 
when public comment is requested. You just click on the right corner of the WebEx screen. There will be a question button where you click on and you submit your your request to all panelists and we will call on you and unmute your microphone. So members of the public, it is not necessary to identify yourself to make a public comment. And um, presenters, please, or presenters, uh, public comment, please note if you're utilizing a profane name in your display name, we will not call upon you. If you can please log out, log back in with appropriate display name. If you use profane language, we will also um, be muting your microphone. Um, that is it. I'll turn it back to you, Pat. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I forgot to mention that you uh, were employed by the Department of Consumer Affairs Solid Training and Planning Solutions Office and do a great job facilitating much. All right, let's move on to the presentations. Uh, Paul, I, I know you don't have that much greenery in your office, so you must be uh, teleworking today and giving the presentation from your, from your home, I'm guessing. That's right. I got a virtual background up today. There you go. And Dave, uh, Dave Kusa does as well. Nice uh, backyard there. Looks uh, like the fence and everything. Uh, good to see both of you being able to participate uh, remotely at your homes. Um, anyway, Paul, uh, let's let's dive right into this. Uh, Paul Hedgelin again is an air quality engineer. Uh, well, uh, excuse me. Uh, in a supervising position, a supervising air quality engineer with our engineering and research branch, and has been with the Bureau for a number of years, uh, and uh, an outstanding job for us, uh, handling most of the equipment requirements and other aspects of the smog check program. So I'll turn it over to Paul for the PowerPoint presentation. All right, thank you, welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, we've got some slides here to give you information about proposed regulations for smog check equipment security and fraud prevention. So we'll start out with an overview. Uh, as soon as I get the slides going the right direction here. There we go. Start out with an overview. We'll give you some uh, benefits of the changes and then we'll dive into what the exact changes are in the text and the smog check menu. And uh, this presentation is on our public website too. So to start off, the proposed regulation changes. Uh, there's about four major changes in this package. Um, the first being the addition of biometric security for license inspectors use on both the BAR 97 EIS and the BAR OIS inspection systems. This addition would block unlicensed use of the smog check inspection equipment and will positively authenticate license inspectors and connect them to the inspection. The second change we have adds remote access to both the BAR 97 EIS and the BAR OIS inspection systems. Remote access will allow BAR to interrupt and interact with the licensed inspector during inspections. It will help licensed stations receive BAR assistance and will help BAR investigate suspect activity. So continuing, the third change overview, um, stations cannot have an electronic device or data source known as an onboard diagnostic simulator. Simulators are typically used to substitute actual emissions control system data from the vehicle's computer that would otherwise cause a vehicle to fail in inspection. And there's no legitimate business need for this type of device in a smog check station. And lastly, Proposed regulations allow bar access to stations anytime inspections are occurring, not just during business hours. So with that, we'll move on to, sorry, slides are opposite what I thought. Um, some benefits of the changes. So firstly, um, the proposed regulation will deter unauthorized usage of confidential access code information and positively connect the license inspector to the inspection. Secondly, it will provide the evidence necessary to identify and prosecute individuals involved in the unauthorized and fraudulent use of smog check equipment. 
And thirdly, we'll pr better protect small check inspectors from unauthorized use of their access information, as well protecting station owners who can be held liable for unauthorized inspections occurring at their station. And lastly, we'll protect consumers by ensuring that only properly trained and licensed inspectors are inspecting vehicles at licensed stations. So with that, we'll show you the actual details of the changes. So proposed regulation text, California Code of Regulations, section 334015, subsection G. And the nomenclature displayed on the screen, the strikeout is deleted text and the underline is added text. So the change in this particular subsection G provides bar the authority to access any smog check station when inspections are occurring. So you notice the existing text says during normal business hours and we've added and any time inspections and or repairs are being performed. So that will allow a bar to go in after hours and investigate even after the shops closed at posted business hours. All right, so the next change is same code section, it's a new subsection F. And this is for the biometric portion. Um, and I'll have to walk through this, there's several pieces in here. So firstly, the smog check inspectors must have their biometric data collected and identified, identity verified at a bar field office or during a bar station visits. So what this is saying is the inspectors will have to enroll with bar either by visiting a bar field office or scheduling an appointment with the bar rep to come out and enroll them at the station. At the time of enrollment, they verify their ID using government documents, driver's license, for example, verify they are who they are, say they are, and then they will take their initial scan, biometric scan into the system and that enrolls inspectors. So that's required before using the biometric device during inspections. So then the second portion says, when the inspection platform, EIS or OIS, prompts for use, they're required to use the biometric device. And then the third requirement says they have to use a specific model biometric device. And I'll show that later when I cover the small check manual changes. And the last portion here says that if for some reason the inspector is not able to provide a biometric scan, meaning they have no hands, for example, and we're using a hand palm vein reader. Um, bar would allow them to continue using the access code they use today. Okay, so we'll move on to the next subsection G. This was added for the remote access. So this one says, when prompted by the EIS or OS software, the bar licensee shall permit bar and or a bar designee remote access to view and record audio, video, pictures, and text related to the inspection. So this will allow bar to connect and communicate with the station using a webcam and microphone connected to the inspection system. And to note here that bar can only access that system when the prompt is acknowledged and okayed by the inspector. Okay, subsection H was also added. Um, this is about the electronic device. No licensed station shall have on the premises at any time any electronic device or software that can be used for changing or replacing a vehicle's data no licensed inspector shall use during a small check inspection any electronic device or software for changing or replacing a vehicle's data. So these changes prevent having and using such a device to change the onboard diagnostic data collected at the time of inspection from vehicles. Subsection I was added. Um, basically, failure to comply with the above new items added and some existing items 
or can disable the vid connection from the EIS or the OIS, which stops the inspection, and or direct vehicles to have their next inspection performed at a bar referee facility. And the subsections are all summarized again here for your convenience. It's covering the biometric device, tampering the analyzer, false data entry, not allowing remote access, and possessing a device used to change a vehicle's data. And then to match with the biometric and uh, I'm sorry, remote access and uh, device usage, there were two subsections uh, added into 3394.26. So there's a minimum and maximum fine of 1,000 up to 5,000 for failing to allow bar remote access to the analyzer when prompted by the software and for having on the premises or using during a smart check inspection a device or software for changing or replacing a vehicle's data. So section 3340.45 of the California Code of Regulations incorporates the smart check manual by reference, making it also regulation. So all these changes shown here basically update the regulation to reference a newer updated smog check manual version. And the date currently identified for that version is October 2020. So it'll change the 2017 dated manual we use today to a 2020 dated manual in the future. Now in the smog check manual, there's a proposed smog check manual with corresponding changes to the above regulation text changes we just reviewed. Um, in the beginning of the manual, the section 1.1.2, instead of the access code when performing inspections. It also references the equipment materials table later in the smog check manual, section 1.8, that specifies a certain uh, model device that has to be purchased and used. And then a second change made in the same section of the manual, inspector access. This section says the bar or a bar authorized representative shall use a biometric device to collect inspector biometric data and shall verify the identity using a government issued ID of an applicant or licensee for purpose of authorizing access to perform inspections using the EIS or OIS. So this says that the inspector has to enroll with BAR, do the initial biometric scan before using the biometric device to perform small check inspections. An authorized representative may be a BAR referee if we need that additional help during the enrollment period. Another change in the inspector access area of the manual Excuse me, call I got coming in. Um, upon proven incompatibility with the biometric system, BAR may allow access to the BAR 97 EIS or BAR IS using inspector's license number and BAR assigned access code. So as I covered earlier in the regulation text, if for some reason the inspector cannot be scanned by the biometric device or uh, has the authority to allow the continued use of an access code or password, we can call it. Okay. This slide just shows the continuation of that same uh, access, inspector access code paragraph. This is all existing language. Uh, it's just here as a reminder that if for some reason inspector's access code has been compromised, uh, the manual asks them to notify BAR immediately. All right, so this is a new section added to the Smog Check Manual, 1.7.4, Virtual Hands-On Inspection. It's what we named the remote access capability. A bar or its designee may remotely interrupt a bar 97 EIS or bar OIS inspection 
and ask the user to permit access to the computer and web camera as specified in the required equipment materials table in section 1.8.0. To perform a bar a virtual hands-on inspection for purposes of observing the inspection process. During the virtual hands-on inspection, bar may record screenshots, still images, video, text chat, and audio. So this similar to the regulation text says bar may interrupt an inspection, prompt the user for access, and then there's associated fines if uh, the user denies bar access. Later in the Smogchik manual, there's section 1.8.0, the equipment and reference materials table. This table lists all the required equipment for smog check stations. And at the top of the table, we made a uh, sort of a cleanup revision here to clarify that only the data acquisition device portion of a BAR OIS inspection system is, the cert is certified by BAR. So only that one piece of the system. Um, this first bullet is not quite worded correctly. It still says BAR certified equipment for OIS. So the OIS itself is not BAR certified, but the DAD portion is. So that's what this is clarifying. Also in the equipment and reference materials table, uh, there's a bunch of new language added for the web camera that will be required. So the web camera will be required in all four smog check station types and not required in the repair only stations since they don't do inspections. The web camera will be required on both BAR 97 EIS and BAR OIS. And then it lists a number of performance requirements that stations or inspectors purchasing the camera need to meet these requirements to ensure we have a good quality audio and video from all the stations. And lastly, it states a, it's a wired camera and they're permitted to use an extension cable, which will allow them to reach the vehicle for up close photograph. This slide summarizes. Um, the web camera has a built-in microphone, which would be used with remote access software on the OIS and EIS to allow BAR to communicate with inspectors. Uh, we research different models of cameras. Meeting all those requirements cost up to $150. There would be no cost for the ROIS software. However, the cost for BAR 97 software is unknown at this point because it may use the same solution as BAR OIS. Or if it's BAR 97 software changes, it will depend on station leasing, owning the equipment, and a number of other factors. So this slide shows the specific biometric device required as listed in the equipment and reference materials table. Forever EIS and OIS, a Fujitsu palm vein scanner sensor model FAT13 FPS01 with two meter long USB cable is required. So it's <laughs> easy for me to say. It's a specific biometric device model um, the kit sold by a number of vendors includes a sensor, a cable, and a hand guide to position the hand for easier use. Costs about $400 for the kit. Again, there would be no bar OS software cost, and the bar 97 software cost is unknown for reasons I stated earlier. This last slide just shows. A uh, picture of the Smogchik manual equipment re required equipment table. And this is the web camera requirements I had on the prior slide. And here's the biometric model number requirements on a prior slide. And it shows check marks, meaning it's required for all four station types and not repair only station. So with that, we'll open it up for comments and questions. Thank you. Good job, Paul. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation. We have some hands already raised, uh, like Dave Kusa. I saw yours first with the Automotive Service Council of California. 
Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Paul. Um, so a uh, number of questions in the section 30, 3340.41H with the um, equipment uh, changing or replacing data, um, many factory scan tools, aftermarket scan tools, will you know, we use them every day to update or reprogram vehicles. Um, how will we exclude that from a piece of equipment that updates or changes data? Sure, good question. Um, we have been looking at that very question just recently. Um, and you're right, there are legitimate electronic devices in a smog check station to reflash a vehicle computer, for example. Um, so we may add a couple words to that particular section to narrow the focus. Um, maybe the words OBD in there, uh, maybe during an inspection, things like that would narrow it down to what we're looking for and not affect other equipment. So the thank you the, the equipment the, and I mean I know what you're talking about when you're the band equipment specifically right um, but I'm not familiar with how though that equipment operates would it is would that equipment only be used during a smog test or is it the reason I'm asking is is it all shops would not be allowed to have the band equipment or just test and test the you know test repair test only uh, shops you know would would not be allowed. You know, if somebody doesn't do smogs and they have an emulator or a simulator, um, is that, you know, is that still illegal? Because I don't know if you can use it otherwise other than only during a smog test to change, to, you know, to change the outcome of the test. Right. Good question. Um, obviously, the focus was the target smog stations because that's where it has the, the impact we're looking to address. Um, I'm not sure if it could, that same section would apply to a regular ARD that does repair only or not. Okay. Um, and, and again, I mean, part of the reason I ask is there are, um, you know, uh, shops that do, um, you know, programming for you know, vehicles that, you know, off-road hot rods, show cars, things like that, that aren't necessarily ever going to get smogged. But, and they're not smog check stations, but they do have equipment to uh, program aftermarket type uh, uh, onboard computer systems to control fuel injection, ignition, all those things. So it's uh, something that I think that probably should look at. Um, the um, the palm reader when when the um, technician goes to get uh, certified or you know checked in do, are we doing both hands or just one hand at that point? Um, we're doing both hands. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is just to give them a backup. You know, sometimes yeah. one hand gets injured, for example. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I was thinking, right? If you know, we we hurt one hand and we still have the other. Um, I mean, it is you know in the realm of possibility that somebody breaks both arms and has casts on both arms. Is there a way to temporarily suspend with approval use of the palm reader for someone that may not be able to use it for a certain amount of time? Oh, absolutely. You just work with their field office and, you know, if there's adequate proof that they're incapable of using such a device, they could revert back to the current access code entry. Cool. Thank you. Um, the camera and the biometric reader, um, number of smog shops have multiple machines. Will they need the equipment for each machine or can one set of equipment uh, work with all the machines? It would be one per, so one, one biometric per. device per analyzer, one camera per analyzer. Okay, and then uh, my last question, once once we have the equipment and it's set up in our shop, is there a way to verify with BAR that the equipment actually works? Um, so that with, you know, the first time we try and use it, we, we and it, oh my God, it doesn't work. And then we're looking at, you know, questions. Yeah, we'll work through those issues during uh, implementation and rollout. Um, the, the vendors that they're willing to sell some of this equipment, I mean, they may play a role in that, some of that initial setup. Um, but it is just plug and play equipment, just like we're using webcams right now. Um, the biometric device is the same. It's an off the shelf, plug it in yourself, a USB device. So should be very, very little assistance needed, but yeah, as always, we'll support stations yeah i just want to make sure that you know the, it works the first time we try it and and you're absolutely right i mean it is off the shelf stuff but trust me i can break anything so <laughs> <laughs> thanks thank you that was my last question you're welcome. hey dave this is clay leak um you know we obviously we have a lot of implementation and some details to work out but my envision of of this deployment would be a time period where your password would work and you would also be able to use the new bi biometric device in case there were issues with, the, with that equipment functioning. So we certainly would wanna you know, shake out all the bugs and, and we'll look at all the different options to make sure 
we don't negatively impact people's businesses along the way. Thanks, Clay. Right. Thank you, Dave. Good question. Uh, let's go to the next hand that's raised. Rick Escalambre with the California Automotive. Yeah. Well, in response to Dave's, Dave's uh, question, my experience with the simulators is there in lieu of the vehicle. Am I not cor correct? That simulator plugs into the dad, and and the dad does not plug into the vehicle. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that. Of course, um, you know the bit switchers that are kind of in line. Um, uh, I, I know exist. I'm, I'm assuming that's the same kind of equipment that would be banned. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's it's just the 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 use of a simulator emulator outside of a smog check. You know, it is a is something that you know would be used in certain you know uh, specialty shops um, for you know for a variety of reasons and with no intent of of uh, trying to get around smog check. So you know the you need to look at the. The overall, you know, if, if if I'm not a smog certified shop, am I still part of that ban? Would be the, the question I would ask. Okay. The other question I had, Paul, when do you expect this to uh, officially be added to the manual? Um, so we're just starting the regulation process, which, uh, if they're emergency regulations, it could be we could have the authority uh, late next year. So it, okay. It so depends on how the regulations go through. Um, okay. We're hoping to start optional enrollment of inspectors early next year. But then obviously we need the regulation and authority to mandate its use after that. Okay. And this, and I, I'm sure I think I know the answer. Is, this will have no uh, impact on the training schools. This will only be for the actual ARDs. So if I'm a train, I'm. Skyline College is a training, doing the training. There's not going to be any requirements there for this equipment. Well, you're not doing real inspections in the real production no, environment. Tra so, it's all training. Um, unless you wanted a device for uh, training purposes. Well, that's what I'm wondering is, I know that question is going to come up, is if it's available, if so the student goes out there understanding what they're doing, but the reality is I'm sure it's going to be picked up very quickly in the field. And I know I'll get asked, was this going to impact the schools at all? My impression would be no, but I guess they could do it as an option. There are some schools that are doing live spots, so then they would be set up. This, this is Garrett Torgerson with Bar Engineering. The schools are required to have all the equipment, so yeah, they will need to have the biometric scanner as well. Okay. okay. Now, you going to set? How's that going to work when you got twenty students doing smog? Well, it's going to be one per equipment, just like you would in a normal station. Okay, so you're going to have to scan your whole class into it. I'm not sure how the scanning will work. I just, in terms of the schools themselves, they're required to have the equipment that's actually used in the inspections. And so I, yeah, I don't, I don't know when you're when you're running with a, a fresh group of students or, or applicants. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work yet. As far as requiring the equipment, yes, the schools will have to have it. Okay. Well, those are two questions I need to answer. Thank you. A good question. I don't know that we have thought that completely through yet, Rick. Uh, so I'm glad you raised it. Uh, uh, any other bar advisory group members with questions or comments? Rick, I still, okay. Down. Uh, oh, Rick, I see your hand up again. Are you on two different lines? No, no, there it is. Hey, Pat. Yeah, Rick, is that you again? There is one, there is one word in there in those section 1.1.0. And I know Paul explained it today, but that word may, uh, when I see that in a smog check manual, that word may, without any more information, is kind of vague hanging out there. He cleared it up in his conversation today, but yeah. if I'm reading the manual and I see the word may, I'm I'm wondering. Well, our attorneys don't usually like words like may, so we'll probably have to change that to a must or shall. But can you pull that up again, Paul? The reference? Yeah, because he explained it. I mean, he did a good job explaining it. Yeah, true. When, when I read this ahead of time, and I started the word may, and then I heard Paul explain it. It made sense for the reasons why they would allow 
the access code to be used. But in the manual, if you look at the word may, it just it's, it's just hanging out there. It's leaving it's it's leaving it un, unanswered as far as I'm concerned, unless you have the explanation that Paul used. It's on the right slide now, Rick. But, uh, yeah, it was just yeah, it's the, the one right point. The no, no, I think it was, I picked it up in the letter. Um, the revisions in the letter, and I think it was also in, where did I see it? I had it marked here. Um, yeah, it was 1.01. 1 .01. There was a word may in there. Let me see if I just gotten back to that page. Um, well, I know I saw it earlier. Uh, and I know it was in the uh, presentation too. Um, the word may, maybe it's been fixed in this draft. But that was the only thing I would, that's the only thing I was wondering about is just leaving hang, people hanging out there. But you cleared it up beautifully when you said it about the reasons why they might have access. Uh, it'd be nice to see some of that verbiage rather than the word may. Okay. Okay, we'll search for the word may. Yeah, I'm, I had it, I had it down as 1.10 and then I had it, um, I think I saw it earlier too. Um, Looking at a couple different documents here, I'm not seeing them clearly, but um, if you see the word may, it's just something to think about. I know I definitely saw it in your presentation. Well, you had on the previous slide, Paul, it says bar may require, yeah. it was the 1.1.0. 1. 1. 1. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, that was the one that caught my eye. That's all. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? All right, Elizabeth, will you be so kind as to open it up for the, those who are not on the panelists? Yes, I will. Public comments? Yes, thank you. You. I took the presenter role and I um, changed the slide here the, to this slide, but Paul, I'll give you back the presenter role if you need to respond to any questions and reference any of the slides. Sure. So members of the public, I've just opened the Q&A. If you're interested in providing any feedback, question, comment, please click on the Q&A icon. At the bottom right corner of your screen, there's a question mark inside of a square and a QA on the side. And you type, I would like to make a comment in the ask field, and you send it to all panelists. And I would like to remind that the hand raising feature is being used for the advisory group members and bureau staff. So please use the Q&A if you do have um, any questions or comments. And you do not have to use the camera feature. You can um, simply verbalize your comments. And I do have, um, I wanted to confirm with individual RV. I'll double check to see I, if you have a comment in regards to this workshop. You have been unmuted. Hello? Yes. A uh, question for you guys. So what is, we're doing an inspection and in the system required. I was reading about, I was reading the, uh, the bar manual, the new one. It says you can be fined up to thousand, up to $5,000 for not accessing that. What if something is wrong? or our internet is not good enough because our station, we only get a very limited Wi-Fi signal here, internet, and um, our system sometimes slows down or doesn't work. What if middle of a test, that happens and the camera picture is not great or the quality is bad or something is wrong, uh, what happens there? Do we just get an automatic citation for that or is it just, uh, how is that gonna work exactly? No, uh, um, the intent there was if a station flat refused to allow BAR to connect to their analyzer and communicate with them, then the fine would be a possibility. Um, obviously, stations are going to have, uh, they may have a customer to deal with for a minute, or they may have a slow internet connection 
on rare occasion, those kinds of things do come up. So I would expect our enforcement um, folks would not pursue any citation or fine for those uh, normal everyday occurrences. Okay, thanks. Thank you. This is the moderator. I just want to point out. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, you, yes. you, you uh, went muted for a minute. We lost connection, the audio connection there for, with you, Garrett. Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, I want to point out, though, that when the reason why we're introducing functionality like this is because there's some stations that are, uh, they're in business to commit fraud. That's their whole purpose. And so, uh, when enforcement uses this functionality to interrupt inspe inspections where thing is suspected of occurring that they're trying to circumvent the rules of smog check, they're going to need to intervene. And it would be very easy for stations that are engaging in this to uh, claim that their internet connection is not working well and use that as an excuse every time it's interrupted. And so, the while Paul said the you know, an occasional interruption like that would probably be overlooked. I think he's absolutely right for stations that engage in that type of excuse or use that as a regular excuse for not letting this functionality go through. I would expect that there will be penalties for that. You were demonstrating firsthand some of the uh, technical <laughs> Your audio went out. <laughs> that, that's what. That's what I'm here is. I'm here as a cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, other did, did anything I say get through? Got through? <laughs> Any other comments from the public? This is the moderator. There's no further request. I did want to clarify that in response to Arby's question, I thought he was asking about the camera feature in WebEx. So that's not necessar necessary to use. I wasn't responding to the professional question about the rate um, associated to the regulation. So I wanted to clarify that. There's no further request. Would you like me to close the Q&A? I do see someone who just jumped in on the discussion. Oh, yes. Thank the you. Summers, uh, asking if, uh, can I purchase the equipment now? Should I mute I him to see if he has further um, oh, comments? Yeah. Certainly, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that, that was the written question. He might have other uh, yes. things to add or say. Thank you. Jonathan, you have been unmuted. Doesn't sound like we're getting audio from Jonathan. So, Paul, question regarding the equipment? Sure. Purchaseability um, now? I mean, I don't know if there's any objection to it, but it, there's no uh, requirement no for us to, uh, to have it in stations at this point. Yeah, I would recommend uh, waiting. Um, the biometric devices are not available. For purchase from the resellers until uh, a few months into next year and given technology changing so quickly um, if you were to buy a webcam meeting the requirements today I mean you may be able to buy something better or more easily in the future when we actually have that software and capability in place um, it's going to take some time for us to update the software and, and require that camera usage. And as we're going through, as we're going through the installation process, uh, we might become aware of something uh, newer and better and may change the standard that we currently have in draft form right now. Uh, at the point we lock it down and it becomes an official adopted regulation, that will be the equipment that so yeah, it would be a little premature to go out and get it right there. And it's not available in the case of the biometric, it sounds like until at least next year. The web camera, obviously. But yeah, hold off for now. 
Uh, other questions? Oh, Robert, uh, Roberto, uh, who was with us at the advisory group meeting earlier today. You also have your hand up, or, or you asked a question, I guess. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I saw question and I've lost it. Just something about, oh, when's the regulation? When will the regulation take effect? And this is the moderator. I have unmuted Roberto. Well, uh, yes, uh, and then uh, wh when uh, this regulation is going to take effect, basically, it's, uh, it's, it's any time soon, or do you guys have uh, any deadline already? Sure, so we're pursuing regulations right now. Um, we're looking at possible adoption date of uh, September or October next year, depending on if the emergency regulation or normal regulation approval process go through. Um, so for biometric would be the first piece we'd start with, and we're hoping to start optional enrollment where we would have the inspectors start scanning into the system early next year before the regulations are adopted. Um, the remote access and camera use, that stuff would come later. Okay, okay, good, good deal. And this is the moderator. Um, there was another comment and question, so Arby, I will unmute your line. Go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question was, so once we have the scanner, the, the biometric scanner for your hands, uh, do we still have to input our access code or is just, it's one or it's going to be just that, uh, just the sensor? So you would use the biometric scanner at the beginning and end of every inspection, and you would still use your access code for other functions that you don't do as often. Um, and the reason for that is if you don't use the access code, I know I would tend to forget it if it were me, and that access code is still going to change every 90 days. So if you want to go read an ET blast or some other function that's not an inspection, you would still use the access code. Got it. Okay, thank you. And no further requests have been submitted. Let me double check here. No, would you like me to close the Q&A or would you like me to leave it open as you? I believe I see a hand up from Megan McKernan from the advisory group. You can keep the... Um... I can do it, I guess, both at the same time. Yeah, you can keep the line open for the public okay. comments, and as they come in, we'll just kind of go back and forth and fit as necessary. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, I saw the hand raised by Nick Sherman with Automobile Club of Southern California. Megan. Not getting any audio. You there? I see you. Can you hear me? Ah, perfect. Okay, That's perfect. It. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to get some clarification. Um, the section amend section thirty three forty fifteen. Um, you said that the smog check um, or that they could have, have access to the smog check station during regular business hours and any time a smog check is being performed. But then I think you made the comment that they could go in after hours if they wanted to investigate something, maybe that had, you know, a, an inspection that had gone on that day. Is, is Did I understand that correctly? No, what I meant to say, and, I, and I, maybe I misstated it, was that if an inspection is performed after business hours, that's when Barr would want to go in. Right, of course, because they're not, okay. Because I was going to say, we shut down our equipment every day, so there would you wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't think access. So that's just what I wanted clarification. And then my second question is, is it basically um, BAR is going to be kind of monitoring stations just regularly and if they think they see something that looks irregular, that's when they would jump in and, you know, get that access? How would that process work? 
Exactly. Um, we can see through the central database when inspections are being performed. And if there's no lights on in the station and nobody's there, for example, they may want to go visit and confirm that, in which case would prove the inspections are being performed away from the registered address of the station. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Some good questions there. Thank you, Megan, for the clarification. Yeah, it's, the concern is uh, visiting stations that are performing inspections at three in the morning. Right. Uh, let's see, any other questions, comments? Megan, you're good. You have your hand up still. Just want to make sure. Okay. It went down. Uh, let's see. Roberto, you're, you're, you have a hand up. I don't know if that means that's been, that's, I think that goes back to our earlier meeting today. That hand's been up all day, but um, just want to double check, make sure we haven't missed anything. Any other follow on comments? No, it's, uh, from, I'm sorry, for, sorry from my side, you know, this is uh, it's good. Uh, you, you guys uh, implemented something like this. Because so me as an instructor, when I'm teaching and I hear a lot of stories, like things going on behind the scenes, doing the small, and things like that, and I, I really uh, look forward to this uh, this type of uh, implementation because that will that will keep us uh, for us doing the right thing, you know, uh, keep uh, our uh, our business going. You know, we don't want to uh, have a bad reputation because all, all the people think that everybody's doing something dirty. You know, that's really good that those implementation is coming into place soon and. Uh, I'll, I'll fully support things like that. Thank you for, uh, for thank you for that, guys. Thank you. thank you for the comment. This is the this is the moderator. No further requests have been submitted from the public comment side. Okay. Well, we're going to adjourn for the second time today uh, earlier than we had planned. I think we're a little bit early. Yeah, we're a little over thirty minutes ahead of our scheduled time. I want to thank everyone who participated in the regulatory workshop, uh, all the advisory group members who stuck around for the workshop, as well as the comments we got from uh, the public, members of the public. So thank you so much for everyone attendance today. Thank you, Paul. Great job with the presentation. I know you've been working tirelessly on these regulations along with uh, Holly O'Connor from our office, uh, who's our regulations coordinator, and um, been doing a lot of back and forth with our legal office to get these regulations in good shape. And uh, hope, hope we can have something um, filed with the Office of Administrative Law to begin a more formal public process on these regulations early part of next year, if not sooner. And there's still two months left in the year. I, I'm not very optimistic on that, but we're, we're really pushing. We really are to try and get this. It's, it's uh, some of the stuff and the abuses we're seeing are just, we can't continue this way. And it's not fair to the industry that's, that's doing a good job and expecting uh, to see these inspections being diverted to those who are really uh, doing nothing but bad for, for the rest of the industry, consumers, and clean air. All right, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day, great evening, and we'll see you in January, our advisory group members at our next advisory group meeting in January. Take care. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, everybody.